How do they do it? Well, we know the answer. It's defense, it's special teams. And on this particular day, it was a um, meaningful drive late in the game to set up uh, Drew Stevens to be a hero and be uh, special teams player of the week, something that uh, I was pretty much laid a claim to the entire season. Welcome to Hawkeyes Live right here at the Voice of College Football. Appreciate you all stopping by. Leave those comments and questions there in the live chat. Of course, Red Curse is straight ahead. We will talk Scarlet Knights and in many ways, uh, a mirror image of Iowa football, uh, this particular Rutgers team. So Corey Brad is here, of course, to make it all happen from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Corey, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Mirror image. So I'm assuming we're not talking about the quarterback position because you got uh, <laughs> two opposites at the, at the quarterback position. But you're right, as far as uh, defense focus, and I was, I was impressed with what Rutgers was able to do to kind of stymie Ohio State. I know Ohio State's offense is not what it was a year ago. You you know that better than anybody, Mark. But uh, I was impressed with them, and I expect it to be another close game. Uh, heck, if Northwestern is a close game uh, in a packed Wrigley that's mostly Iowa fans, then I would expect Chiano to bring his team ready. And, uh, yeah, Iowa has a knack for winning these close games, but it should be a, a nail-biter. Under the lights. The game should finish under the lights now with daylight savings time. And certainly there's a number of days to get ready uh, for the, the the Rutgers game and talk about that. But uh, there's some meaningful news off the field related to recruiting. And we've got uh, Tom Caker joining us uh, from the Hawkeye Report to uh, help us break it down. Tom, how are you doing today? Doing well. How are you guys? We are doing just fine. Appreciate you being here. Uh, yeah. I believe this is the first interaction we've had. My name is Mark, Mark Rogers, uh, Hi, here at the Mark. Voice of College Football. Heard great things Thanks about for you. joining us. Yeah, appreciate that. So, Tom, I, I appreciate you jumping on here. Um, I'll kind of, I'll kind of take it from here. You and I recorded a segment here a couple months ago when Nick Brooks committed, and of course, you're no, you know, you're not, you don't have some crystal ball to foresee the future. But I remember us having this discussion. Uh, about his future and how solid his commitment to Iowa was. And I remember making the comparison to the Caden Proctor situation. And you kind of said, oh, well, let's let's treat this uniquely. He is not Caden Proctor. I don't think his focus is maybe where Caden Proctor's family's focus was, and et cetera. The circumstances are just different. And I'm sure you wouldn't change your uh, tune on that yeah. note. But the news today that Nick Brooks is decommitted from Iowa, I think, blindsided a lot of people. We knew he came off an official visit to Texas Tech. Were you surprised by this news, and how have things changed within just a couple of months? wasn't surprised once I saw he took a visit um, because of, uh, here's what I think. I think the kid just wants to take more visits, and in order to take more visits and st still stay in the good graces of place where he may end up going, University of Iowa, he just decommitted. You know, I, I think that's really just all this was at this point is a kid that wanted to see more places, take more visits. And in order to do that, um, he had to decommit. So um, I, don't, I don't know that there's really a whole lot more behind it than, than that. I don't know that there were bags of money or you know, deals or anything. It just seems like the kid wants to, it was, it was curious last week when he put up the thing about Texas tech offering him, usually that's an indication. And then he sh shows up on Instagram down in Lubbock and uh, there you go. So we'll see what happens from here, but you know, again, he's a 2025 kid. So we're a year and a month plus from him being able to sign anywhere. So it's nothing about a bag of Lubbock loot. Yes. <laughs> you yeah, I, it's, it's... I just I just think I think I will probably communicated with them. Hey, if you if you want to take visits, you can take visits, but just let us know. And if you want to take them, just you know, it's probably best that you just decommit and and uh, you know, it's it's like if you're gonna get married. If you're gonna get married, you can't go out on a on dates with other people. So Iowa looks at commitments like that as like a marriage. And uh, if you want to date, you can go ahead and date, but we're not going to be consider ourselves married to you anymore either. So I know that 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 brings up a whole new can of worms for me, Mark or uh, Tom. So excuse me, because 
Caden Proctor took a bunch of visits as he was committed. So just explain to the common fan why he was allowed to do that while staying engaged to Iowa and Nick Brooks was not. Well, I don't, I, it's not like being allowed. It was just, Hey, if you want to do it the right way, this is how you do it. Okay. Proctor probably just said, I just going to go ahead and do these things. You know, they communicated to him that those things, those exact same things, Brooks is just going to be more upfront about it and just decide to decommit. Does that make sense, Mark? Well, uh, I, it sounds like that there are different standards for different uh, talent levels or something. Maybe I'm reading too much into that, but it, um, it, it, it there seems to be a strong preference toward wanting that commitment to stick at Iowa. And I can certainly respect that because otherwise why commit? I've always wondered that, you know, if you're not sure, then yeah. don't commit. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's the thing I always come back to. If you, if you've got any wavering, it's not like you're reserving your place. If you want to, you know, it, I use the marriage analogy, Kirk French uses it too. It's just like, are we, are we holding hands? Or are we getting married? You know? And if you're, you want to hold hands and you want to go out on other dates, perfectly fine. And Iowa can't prevent someone from doing that. And kids could take up to 10 visits now. And if you do that, that's fine. But um, we're not going to, we're also going to go on dates. You know, we're going to go pursue some other guys in that class that, that, um, you know, now that that spot's open. And that's probably what I was saying right now is, all right, we'll find some other old linemen that um, maybe we, we had already kind of, started to move on from because we got this kid committed maybe we'll look at guys and and see if they're interested in coming on campus and getting visits in a couple things i just want to add on to this so i don't know if it was my conversation with you tom or i know we talked to elliot uh, clough from the rival Iowa rival site when this occurred when the commitment happened but one of you told me that you expect at the time you expected him to take these other visits Maybe that wasn't you, Tom. Maybe that was Elliot that said that. But again, I go back to that. If he was expected to take the other visits when he committed, what has changed? But I also wonder, is there maybe more of a, with what happened with Caden Proctor in that situation, maybe a little bit of a different approach to communication from Iowa than prior, just to not have a repeat of what happened with Proctor? Well, I know that Iowa told him when he committed hey, these are kind of the expectations. If you commit, this is kind of how we view things. We're not going to go out and recruit other guys or for your spot. We're not going to dump you for another guy. You're committed. We're committed. We're going to move forward together. Um, but we also have an expectation that you don't go out on visits with other, on other, to other programs and, um, you know, potentially pursue those programs or that let those programs continue to pursue you. It's, it's a two-way street, you know, I was not going to do their, do their recruiting anymore. They just consider that spot full or filled. I should say not full, but filled. And they expect to get to honor that. And I, I don't think that's an unfair ask. I don't, but I just don't think they should just don't commit. You know, right. wait. Yeah. If you're good enough, they'll hold a spot for you. Well, I guess again, I keep saying two things, but two things to follow up on that, Tom. He he, and I don't want to di over dissect this, and maybe I'm known for doing this, but with with Nick Brooks, um, I think it's fair to say, regardless, maybe he ends up back at Iowa. That's that's fair, and I'd much rather yes. as an Iowa guy, I'd much rather him make this decision, this announcement now than on signing day or the signing week, yeah. as Caden Proctor did, but. I think it's clear he would not have committed like he's not in the same place he was when he committed. So, you know, we're not saying that I think it's fair to say you're not saying, Tom, that he's definitely a Hawkeye now because we felt right. like when he committed that, hey, if he's taken on these expectations that Iowa has for him, he's he's a Hawkeye. And now that's in doubt again. And that's the other thing with the, you know, trying to compare it to Caden. I mean, Caden was right at the end of the process where he was running around to Oregon and Alabama. And this kid's, you know, like I said, he's 14 months or, you know, 13 months from signing anywhere. 
Right. So there's just a lot more time where you can say, all right, we'll just let's just slow things up here. Let's call off the engagement. Let's see what's out there and we can always come back to each other. And I think that's what they're going to do. And Iowa will probably still continue to recruit him as they should. And he will probably continue to show up at Iowa things as he probably should. But you wonder, the one thing you do have to wonder about is, was there any damage to that relationship? Or do people just kind of understand now that, hey, this is just how the game's done? Um, and, and to be honest, since I'm positive that Iowa told him since he took the visit, hey, this is the action you should probably take if you want to continue to take visits, and he's doing that. Um, and he's receptive to, to this is the way I need to do it. I think there's a there's a decent chance for reconciliation down the road. Do you believe that there's any link, Tom, to Brian's dismissal, maybe no. some uncertainty regarding George Barnett, anything like that at all, or maybe even Kirk Ferentz? No, I don't think there's anything to that, especially, you know, Brian. Brian wasn't really involved in his recruitment. It was just mainly George. And I've not gotten any hint of or whiff of George Barnett's job is in jeopardy at all. Um, I am curious, Mark, I want to get your opinion on this and we can go back to Tom for, for one final thing. And we, we wanna, if he's got time to answer a question on the press conference today, great. But sure. yeah, uh, t Mark, Tom mentioned, uh, you know, the expectation from Iowa's side, and I understand it, that once you're committed, they don't feel like they should have to continue to recruit you. But, I mean, is that fair to you? I mean, I know maybe that, that makes sense to us, but in this era with NIL and the transfer portal and power to the players, I mean, I agree. A commitment should be a commitment. But reasonably, we all understand decommits happen all the time. Wouldn't it be in your best interest to continue to recruit a player hard even all the way up to signing day, even if he commits 13 months or 15 months prior to signing day? Well, I think there's a difference between what is fair and what's effective. So I know Dabo Sweeney at Clemson is very hard line about he doesn't want any commitments from anyone and will not allow them to. And when I say allow, that's not something that he can enforce, but he's very firm about, you know, don't be taking any other visits once you've committed because we take that very seriously. Now, is that going to be an effective way to recruit going forward? Um, probably less than it has been in the past. And with a with a coach the level of Debo Sweeney or Kirk Ferentz, they can certainly get away with what others can't uh, because of the level of coach and their reputation and their program. Uh, but I would think it's going to be more, less effective going forward because of all the options and, and just because of the, the way – the recruiting game is is played going forward. And Tom, what I think of when I think of players like this, I think of Caden Proctor, Eno Benjamin. Now I think yeah. of Nick Brooks. And those, like, it's not like those guys just proved to be flops. I mean, we don't know Proctor's, you know, he's still playing his freshman year, but he's, last I knew he yeah. was starting, Eno Benjamin was you know, breaking all kinds of records in the Pac-12. So, I mean, like, is it fair? Like, are, are you, how, how do you feel about the critics that would say, that's kind of an antiquated way of look and stubborn way of looking at recruiting. If you're Kirk Ferentz. Well, let me, let me clarify something. Um, I, I don't mean to say that Iowa stops recruiting those kids. Once they're committed, they continue to recruit them just as hard as if they were uncommitted. So that, let, let me just, <laughs> I don't want people to think that, Oh, well, they just get them committed and then they just sit them off to the side. That's not yeah. how it works. They are still calling them every week. They're still, sending them notes they're still getting them on campus they're still going to their schools they're still doing all of those things that you have to do to recruit a kid they're not just putting them off to the side um i i don't think it really uh, fire your question back at me again well just i'm just curious you do you feel like there's a an argument that could be made that it's a little bit antiquated to expect yeah a, a committed student athlete now just to say, nope, I'm not taking visits, even if Alabama or Texas calls. It is. Um, I think it's it's a hard way to do business. Um, it's a choice. 
Um, but I think also tell those kids and their parents, hey, if you want, want to still engage in the recruiting process, that's perfectly fine. Just decommit. You know, right. just open things up. Because if you're going on those visits, if you're dating, you're not married to us anymore. I think it's fair. I think yeah. it's fair from both sides. I think it's fair for kids to take more visits. And I think it's fair for Iowa to tell them, then just decommit. We can still recruit you. We'll still, um, you know, keep dating. But um, it, I think it offers clarity for both sides. Kind of feels like a formality, doesn't it? Like you're committed, but you're taking more visits. So like, okay, are you technically committed? Are you technically decommitted? You know, like, what's the difference at this point? Guys are not actually locked in. It's like being engaged until you sign yeah. the dotted line and put that ring on your partner's finger. It's like, legally, they're not, you're not bound. So, yeah. uh, but anyways, uh, you had a question, I know, Mark. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, ask an overall recruiting question. We are five weeks away from National Signing Day, the early signing day. So not just from a talent standpoint, but from a positional needs standpoint, do you think... I was in line, Tom, for a strong class. How would you rank this class? Not, you know, maybe specifically. Oh, we lost Tom. I don't think he liked your question, Mark. <laughs> he, he didn't like where I was going with that, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> that doesn't bode well for the 2023 class. I'll tell you there, 2024 class. <laughs> he, he didn't want to face the music, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, but, maybe uh, I'll ask you. you. You're pretty heavy in the recruiting game, and I think Tom's going to jump back in with us. There we go. Probably one of those deals with the phone, I'm guessing. Tom, I, I'm not being trying to not no. be too offended by you cutting out of my question. No, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I hit the wrong That's button. I was pulling up the recruiting list and I hit the button to to that link. And uh, and and I was like, uh oh, that's not right. I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, just basically, uh, if you believe that I was headed toward a strong class, not just from a yeah. talent standpoint, from a positional need standpoint. Yeah, I do. I think, um, you know, it's about where you think a Kirk Ferentz class is going to be. It's um, we have them ranked 33rd in the country, um, a little low uh, at 10th, but they've got, uh, you know, 20 commits in the 2024 class, good in-state group, um, filled a lot of needs. they They've got all their different, um, you know, the different positions that they usually uh, try to hit, offensive line, defensive line, uh, some tight ends, really like the tight end group, uh, like uh, K.J. Parker, an athlete they got from uh, Mac Conception High School in Elmhurst, Illinois, that um, former Hawk Matt Bowen coaches at. Had a good in-state running back that got hurt during the year in Brevin Dahl. James Reeser is the, the – uh, quarterback in the class, but, uh, I think it's a, it's a pretty solid group. You know, it's not, it's, it's kind of what you expect from an Iowa recruiting class is what I'm getting at. I think, uh, just throw my two cents and you know, a lot better than I do, Tom, but I get the feeling I've gotten the feeling since they both committed that maybe assuming Brevin heals up as he should, that he and Michael Burt maybe are my two underrated prospects. Um, yeah. I'm not into recruiting rankings or anything, but I mean, it, those guys popped off just watching them. Yeah. Wieskopf, Dirk Wieskopf uh, is another kid, kid from Williamsburg who I think is a stud. Um, you know, I'm the, the, the position group I'm really intrigued by is the defensive line. Cause they've got a couple of guys that I'm like, boy, these guys are really intriguing. Joseph Anderson, the kid from, uh, uh, St. Louis and uh, also um, uh, Kennedy, uh, the the other Devin Kennedy, the other uh, defensive end from Phoenix. I'm just super intrigued by both those guys, um, and I think uh, Hoffman, uh, Gavin Hoffman, the tight end from from Overland Park, Kansas, is another kid that potential, you know, early impact guy. And I'm really interested in Drew Campbell, the the uh, younger brother of, of Jack and see how he's, he's going to be um, and uh, a different, different position, different type player, but got a good bloodline there. The athleticism, you talk about those defensive linemen, Tom, I mean, you mentioned Kennedy and I mean, even Chima, right? Chinake. Yeah. Uh, he's, Chinake, Chima. Yeah. He, he's kind of, he's kind of raw. 
Uh, yeah, they've got some good athletes. Like, they got. I look at those guys as like a big piece of clay yeah. that you can mold, and and they're both. All three of those guys are kind of like the the long arm, long levered kind of players that you can build up, and and you know, two. It might take them two years, three years to really get going, but I think there's a chance that those guys could be pretty good. Kind of like a maybe, a, but I, well, a couple of those guys. I mean, I watch when I'm watching Chinnake, Of course, I've never seen him in person, but I mean, he kind of reminds me of maybe a bigger version of a of a. Uh, well, now, man, my my mind totally blanked on me. Um, former linebacker that moved to edge, help me out on this, Tom. Special teams guy from several years ago that was kind of acted like he was on roids. <laughs> Who's the guy? Who, who, who am I thinking of? The guy that was. Oh, was I think he was fifty two. He wore number fifty two, and he tr- he moved from linebacker to to edge. I think his senior year, and he was always making plays on kick uh, kick coverage. Man, I can't think of who I'm at the top Drawing of my blank. mind. Anyways, on a blank. <laughs> Some of these guys they remind me more of like uh, Chauncey Golson, um, just okay. in terms of their frame and length. Bigger, and, yeah. and Chauncey's Chauncey's carving out a really nice career with the Cowboys right now. Yeah, he is. Absolutely. Uh, Tom, before we let you go, I do want to ask you, I sure. uh, I know you were there in person and I'm, I'm not part of the Tuesday press conferences. Was there anything today to take from Kirk's presser that you thought was of note? I mean, it sounds like, I mean, I think the major topics, Caleb Johnson, that's the one that I think most people are intrigued by why he didn't play on Saturday. And Kirk kind of brought up just practice. We play our best guys. There's no drama there, but you know, in saying that, you kind of create a little bit of drama because it sounds like maybe he did something in practice or you know, the fact that he gets no snaps from being the starter week one. Apparently, he was healthy. That's obviously a question mark. And then, of course, the Cooper DeGene topic. Um, Kirk's not going to probably uh, give us much. I know you – I think you were the one that asked that question where you I asked did. about number of snaps he can handle. So what popped off the uh, the transcript for you? Um, Just the – I think – you know, I had to ask about Cooper because he's just, you know, everybody's curious. How much are you going to play him? How much, how many snaps can you give that kid? And can you use him differently? Can you use him beyond just the little um, jet sweep motion thing? Uh, can you, can you put him in a wildcat? You know, could you do that? I knew that I knew the answer to that one. Uh, unfortunately, um, I, I just had a feeling he was going to, shoot down that one for sure. I'd probably have gotten a snort if I would have asked about the uh, wildcat. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I just think you got to figure out ways to get that, that kid the ball, you know? And I know, Kirk, you know, Kirk rattled off, well, he's on all the special teams and he's on playing every defensive snap and, you know, all the things he was just telling, basically telling us, We'll probably throw him out there for a couple of plays is what he was telling us today. Yeah. That's my feel. I think it's great that he played. And I think I agree with you, Tom, it, you know, the, the idea of him, a wildcat, we've talked about that as a wildcat quarterback during our post game shows, just what he would bring being a former quarterback in high school. I just don't know. Here's what I don't know, Tom, as great of an athlete as Cooper is. And I know there's a fear about injuries. I also wonder if, this, this is not a rip on Brian or Kirk or anybody in this offensive staff. I do wonder, though, if this staff is creative enough to effectively use him, like to actually scheme up yeah. ways to get him involved. I do wonder that. Sure. That's, it's, it's, that's it's, fair. I would just I would just put him back there in the Wildcat and have him run a couple RPOs or sure. um, just to kind of run to the edge, maybe step back and fire the ball down the field and see what happens. Uh, that's yeah. what I would do. But, I mean, it's it's not like – um, the offense is blowing the doors off uh, the building every time it goes out there, right? You know, <laughs> you, really, is there something? Go. There's okay. only one way to go for the Iowa offense, right, Mark? There's one way, and that's up. That's it, unless they right add now. more FBS teams next year, I guess. <laughs> Which <laughs> is possible, right, down. Mark? <laughs> yeah, so that's possible. But yeah, I'm not sure. There's. I'm not sure adding more teams would would raise Iowa's rank. Well, that's you what know? I'm saying. They can go down. Yeah, they would go down teams. further. They could go to 135. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm looking at, what, 10 or 12 plays. You, you you use him maybe 10 or 12 plays, and that doesn't mean he gets the ball 10 or 12 times. Nope. That means you not only utilize him maybe for three or four of those, 
but you create tension for the defense knowing there's a reason he's on the field and maybe it opens it up for somebody else as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's just, I, I was just talking to somebody today and I'm like, you know, they're one bad call. This team is one bad call away from being uh, a one loss team this year with like a historically bad offense. And the last time they, I, I had to look it up uh, this week, and it was after the, the week. The last time, they're, they're like 225 yards, I think, per game total offense, which is just unreal in this day and age. And um, it's like they defy gravity. But the last, the last time they had an offense that produced um, this low was, was the Bob Cummings last year in 19. 19- 78 and that was 222 last time they were under 220 yards was frank lauderburg's first year in 1971 when they averaged uh 217 yards per game and that year they won one game even in the lauderburg um owen 11 season of 73 they were still able to get 247 yards per game of total offense so in Tom, a day and, go ahead. In a, I was just going to say, in a day and age, if if we went through the averages of yardage per game, yeah, is considerably less than what it is now. Yeah, yeah, and so if you like prorated it, uh, like to call it to inflation or whatever, it was, yeah, you know, <laughs> it's probably 150 yards per game. Yeah, like yeah, so today's just... yeah today's 220 or 230 back then, yeah. Yeah, so it's just, um, it is unbelievable that they're able to do this. Can I, ask I, you? I don't know. I don't know how they do it. I even asked Kirk, I'm like, how do you guys do this? <laughs> I asked him that today in the press conference. I'm just like, you play these games and it's like 10-7 and you seem to win all of them. And I don't know how you do it. It's like, it's like uh, playing, playing poker. And every time, like, the river card t- turns over, it's in your advantage, and you win the hand. I don't know how you do it. Can, can I ask you, Tom? I'm curious. Uh, flash me back to the Greg Davis era for a second. Sure. Um, because, I mean, I remember that era vividly, and you know, everybody complained about the vertical. GD, the, GD. The whole... Yeah. It was GD, <laughs> GD. I'll, the, I'll let you guys figure out what the what the first GD was. But but Tom, the, hor- Davis. the the horizontal passing yeah. game, and yes. everybody always complained about it. And I understand it wasn't always pretty. But what's different? What what? How was this different? How was the not, the offense the last three years been any different from that? If not worse, yeah. much worse. Yeah, it's not. It, you know, and I always say this about Brian. Brian's first three years weren't terrible. No. No, they weren't terrible. They, they, they weren't terrible. They were they were ab- above average for an Iowa offense, scoring points. You know, they they were able to do things, but he also had T.J. Hawkinson. He had uh, Amir Smith Marset. No fans. No fans. Uh, he had some talent, and you know, then as the talents kind of thinned out, so has the production, and. You know, frankly, I think the game's just sort of changing right now. And and even like even Army decided to change their offense this year. So I happen to know one of the coaches who was on the Army staff who helped lead that change. So um, it happens to be a guy from the Quad City. So, um, yeah, you just you've got a lot of they, they realize you can't keep playing this way and expect to be successful and expect to be attractive to other programs to, you know, if that coaching staff wanted to move up to, you know, Jeff Monken wants a better job than army. He's going to have to run an offense. That's not the, 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 uh, you know, the wing T or whatever. And, And as you know, Tom, all these service academies have taken kind of the same bent in the last few years where they're still super, super run oriented but they are passing effectively. They're still not passing much, but more than they were. Mm-hmm. And they're, 
you know, their, their typical game is six for 10, but they're throwing for 150 yards. Like they're, they're effective throwing the ball. So from an effectiveness standpoint, they're even better. Well, yeah, I go back, Iowa. I go back to Purdue. Purdue's an, and I asked Don Patterson this question, and, and I was kind of frustrated as I asked the question. I said, Don, please explain to me. And I understand there's some carryover from the Jeff Brom era and him exiting. Explain to me how a guy like Ryan Walters can come over from Illinois. He's a defensive coordinator. He gets there, and in year one, their offense is exponentially better than Iowa's. Like, I, I understand they're not a complete team and they're struggling this year in the West, but I mean, like, their offense is unquestionably better than Iowa's offense has been any of the last three years. How is that possible? <laughs> How is it possible? Unless it's just a question of who he's brought on as, as coordinator. And I mean, are, are the personnel really that much better at Purdue? I just, that's what's so unfathomable to me. But here's the other thing. What happened when Iowa and Purdue play? Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what the the bottom line is. The bottom line, and well, you know, that's, I was, I, and I'll say this too. You look at, um, and Kirk Ferentz will say this. And I'm I'm a hundred percent sure when we have discussions with him after the season about the offense and kind of the bigger picture things that that we tend to talk about. He's going to bring up Wisconsin and how they have struggled this year on offense, and they tried to do this. You know, the, the pass offense and everything, and it just has kind of, I don't say flopped, but it hasn't gone as planned. A part of that, Tanner Mordecai's hurt now, but it just haven't gone well. Yeah. Yeah. So on Saturday, Tom, though, I was going to see a team in Rutgers yeah, that has a very limited offense, but. Yep. From an effectiveness standpoint, it's like Iowa on steroids, and it's still not a good offense. Yeah, like Kirk yeah. Sharaka is a really good. He's a really good OC. I know he didn't have a great run at Penn State, but at Minnesota with PJ Fleck, he was really good um, early on, and um, he's had some he's had some success. Uh, frankly, I think the Rutgers game is the toughest one left on the Iowa schedule. Just because I think Shiano is a really good coach and he kind of he's kind of built a better culture there than there is at Illinois or at Nebraska uh, that's more identified with him. The, the question is, um, will Gavin Wimbush throw critical interceptions like he did at Wisconsin and like he did at, against Ohio State that essentially flipped the game? And if you can avoid those plays, they got a chance to win in Iowa City. If he throws that interception to Cooper to Gene and he takes it 90 yards, then guess what? Iowa's probably going to win. Uh, real quick, so Hawkeye fan in the chat says, Corey, you do not understand football. It is about winning and not if they have some offensive plays. Appreciate that, Hawkeye fan. Always appreciate his uh, opinions, his or her opinions. But anyways, I'm going to give you – we can talk about Rutgers, and obviously it's that's yeah. the week, but then I know – I. We've you we've allowed you to uh, drift off into the five o'clock hour, so I apologize for that. Tom. Yeah, I got I, I've got to jump on a radio show here in a, about two minutes. So okay, let me ask you one final question. We'll we'll cut you loose. Everyone's talked about OC changes. Obviously, we're gonna have a lot of time to talk about it mm -hmm. after the after the season's over. I'm gonna give you three names. You tell me which one is most likely to be considered by okay. Kirk Ferentz. And I'm not gonna go right. I'm not gonna go grub because I think that's a pipe dream. Uh, yep. Joe Moorhead, Nate Shieldhouse. Or Andy Ludwig, which one is most likely to be in consideration by Kirk? Do you think Andy Ludwig? And it's not even close. Okay, why do you say that? Um, it's got a relationship with him. Okay, you know they they know each other pretty well. There you so go. So I would think that that's, and I'm not sure he'll take it, but um, there's at least a relationship there. Tom, appreciate you joining us. HawkeyeReport.com. Okay. We'll talk to you Saturday after the game. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks, you, Tom. Wisconsin, by the way, is 76th in total offense at 375 yards per game. So that's about, what, 140 yards per game above Iowa. If if Iowa had Wisconsin's offensive production, they'd be, you know, the, the bad call wouldn't have cost them. And – 
they would have played a pretty respectable game at Penn State. They'd be in the college football playoff hunt. <laughs> yeah, they'd be eight and one, <laughs> and they would have lost to Penn State. Sure, you know, by ten. Let's be honest. If they even if they got beat thirty one zero to Penn State, we we both said this that they'd be in the playoff hunt right now if they had a swinging chance in the Big Ten title yeah. game. If they go twelve and one Big Ten champions, it's going to be hard to keep them out. But they yeah, can't because do of who they get to play. Yeah, correct, correct. Uh, and who that one losses to? Um, I love this OC conversation, Mark. Every day I think I have more. I had a an interesting thought today and. I actually brought it. I'll admit I brought it up. I was on the phone with with Coach Patterson this afternoon, and I actually brought it up to him. So I won't share what he said on it. But I know Kirk really likes Liddell Betts. I really like Liddell Betts. He's been coaching running backs now at Iowa for several years. I think that's been a healthy room since he took over. And I just wonder if he's – I'm not saying he's qualified to be an offensive coordinator. Believe me, that's not what I'm saying. But given the fact that Kirk only has a few years left – I, I just wonder if it could work bringing in a guy like, I don't know, a QB's guru, whether it's Randy Hedberg from North Dakota State or someone else that could function as a passing game coordinator. You elevate Liddell Betts to run game coordinator, and those guys kind of work hand in hand. That does work in certain places. Now, ultimately, someone's got to be the final say as to run versus pass. What are you doing? But uh, when it's determined if you're running or passing, then you have two different play callers and two different specialized play callers. I don't know if that would work or if Kirk would entertain something like that. It probably won't happen, but I just know he likes Liddell Betts a lot and, and I would be comfortable with that. If it was the right guy as passing game coordinator. And the reason I bring up Randy Hedberg, we've talked about it before. He was interested in the qu- quarterback coaching job two years ago, and he's been the passing game coordinator at North Dakota state for quite a while. Was responsible for, you know, helping three different players at North Dakota state, you know, trans translate to being from being, you know, zero to three star quarterbacks into NFL guys who are still playing in the league. Carson Wentz just signed with the Rams today. Easton Stick is still the backup with the Chargers, and um, Trey Lance is down with Dallas. So, uh, anyway, just a thought. So, unless that uh, candidates list is rather long, you gave Tom three selections, and he was really confident with one. Yeah, I didn't. I, I have not done enough research on some of these guys. I know like his crew on, on three's crew, Hawkeye report.com. They do a great job. And I know they put out some, some early candidates for the job potentially. Um, so if obviously, you know, Tom thinks that Kirk's going to go with someone he knows. Um, I didn't add Joe Philbin to the mix. Maybe if I had added Joe Philbin, you know, that'd be more of a conversation. Now I don't think Andy, I don't know how old Andy is, but he's not Joe Philbin's age. Uh, but Philbin would be another guy you would think maybe, um, but, you know, Grubb doesn't have any connection to, to Iowa other than he's from Iowa and his system at Washington. I cannot. Can you imagine him coming to, to Iowa, given what he's done at Washington? I mean, it would be fabulous. I would love it to death, but I just cannot imagine. And, I, you know, this is another conversation we had the other day on the air. Would there be any reason for Grubb to come to Iowa? He's making what is he making there as offensive coordinator? You want me to take a guess? I'll uh, look it up as you. I, I got to think that the Pac-12 is not paying in, in a place like Washington. If he was in the SEC or a couple stops in the Big Ten, I would put him in the 1.2 million range. But I'm going to say more like, well, Brian was making and is making what 950. Well, you're gonna you're gonna be very surprised when I give you the number. One he, two. He's making two million a year. Okay. He's making two million a year. Okay. So what what reason would he have to come to Iowa at this point? And I have a hard time imagining him not getting some power five offers, head coaching yeah. offers by the end of the year, anyways. So unless he wants to be closer to home and he thinks, hey, Kirk's gonna be gone in a few if they give him indication that Kirk is leaving in a couple of years, you can take over here. You know, maybe that's the only way he'd even consider it and you could possibly get him on, but they're not gonna pay him two million a year (laughs) there's just no way that's just there's just no way that happens if they can upgrade the offense that much and they've got a tv contract that's kicking in at somewhere in the 20 million 25 million more range starting next year they're gonna have to raise everybody's salaries exponentially like phil parker can't be making one million a year and ryan greb comes over and makes two million That, that can't happen so 
I, I think that's a pipe dream. I mean, some of the other names on my list that I think are, are more plausible, um, you know, like a Tim Polisek, obviously that would be a safe one. John Budmeyer is a safe, I say safe one. It's a safe one from Kirk's perspective. I think a, a John Budmeyer hire is extremely risky because he has not proven himself anywhere. Um, he, he struggled at Colorado state in his one year there. He, you know, was the quarterback's coach at Wisconsin and their offense was not great when he was there. I mean, they had decent quarterback production as I understand it when he was coaching quarterbacks, but, um, he hasn't proven anything at Iowa quarterback play has been abysmal since he came here and it was abysmal before, but it has certainly hasn't been better since he got here. So that that's a risky hire. Paul Chris to me is a safe hire from Kirk's perspective and from my perspective. And that would probably be, that'd be my most comfortable choice at this point, given how Kirk wants this op- offense to look. Yeah. I just looked up an article with the 10 highest paid coordinators in college football, I'm not seeing, uh, anyway, that's about, uh, six months old. I don't know what, uh, they have a couple over 2 million, but, uh, yeah, he's, he's in rarefied air. Yeah. And, I, and Mikey, Mike in the chat says Tim Polisek would be my choice. I'm not averse to that. I just know Tim Polisek. I, I've been told on good authority by former players that, his coaching style is so much different than like what George Barnett's coaching style is. And let's be honest, George Barnett hasn't blown the doors off this offensive line group since he got here, but I don't know. I mean, he's been successful. He's a yeller and a screamer and not saying he's another Chris Doyle. I'm not implying that. And I'm not saying I have anything against Chris Doyle, but, but there is that aura about who Chris Doyle was and how he coached as a strength guy at Iowa. Do you bring in a guy who, maybe is a little bit like that. I'm not saying he is another Chris Doyle, but you, you get what I'm saying. I, I still think we're, you know, we're only three years removed from that whole controversy. We're four years, whatever it's been. And we're, you know, a few months removed from the lawsuit finally getting settled. So my guess is they're going to bring in somebody like a Paul Christ who's seasoned and is older. My guess is Kirk doesn't bring in some young gun like everybody wants. Um, or if it is a younger guy, it's going to be someone that, that Kirk is really, really familiar with. And he's certainly familiar with Paul Christ. So, yeah, maybe he can bring in Parker Hesse. Look at Eric Potter in the chat. Okay. Let's bring in Parker Hesse, <laughs> former defensive end turned tight yes. end in the NFL, Mark. Yes. He's ready to go into coaching. <laughs> I think he's doing rather well himself right now. <laughs> Um, how about, how about, how about, uh, how about Nate Shieldhouse? What do you think about that idea? I think that, uh, everyone on that list is successful to a large degree. So Nathan Shieldhouse, yes. I think that'd be a, I, I think, absolutely. I think they should entertain Nate Shieldhouse. Absolutely. I mean, it's, a, it's worth a phone call. I, and I know maybe Kirk wouldn't do that. It's kind of like, Maybe he views it kind of like trying to poach from someone in your conference because they are a team they play every year at Iowa State, but I wouldn't care. I'd go give him a call and say, hey, what's your interest level? Um, you know, I know Nate Schillhouse is a young family and and I'm sure enjoys living in Ames, but Iowa City's a you know, a great place to live as well. Probably a pretty good place to raise a family. And he has coached several positions at Iowa State, and this year has not been great but it hasn't been terrible they've improved in certain facets it's his first year there his dad played at Iowa he's familiar with the Big Ten because he was a quarterback very successful quarterback at Illinois great guy I can tell you that great guy I think it'd be an interesting one and you stick it to the rival absolute process yes. and you stick it to Illinois <laughs> yeah you stick it to Illinois because they stuck it to Iowa with the hire of Brett Bielma See, it all go. What goes around comes around. It, it's just, it's completely fair. Iowa was not looking for a coach. They didn't stick it to Iowa by hiring Brett Bielema. He's an Iowa guy. He's got a Iowa Herky tattoo, a hawk, Tiger Hawk tattoo on his leg. He kisses it every night he goes to bed. Mark, he already, he's coached, at Wis- he already coached at Wisconsin. Well, yeah, well, he stuck it to Iowa at Wisconsin. So did Barry Alvarez. But I'm just saying. 
If you're Iowa, you can stick it to Iowa State and you can stick it to Illinois. What was Illinois like when, during it? I, remind me, because I remember Nate Shieldhouse playing at Illinois. Yeah. Was that the before or after? That was after the Juice Williams era, yes. wasn't it? They were in the, you know, they were bowl teams. They were okay. barely bowl teams. But he was a good quarterback. I mean, he put, I mean, he put up good numbers at Illinois. He was good. He was, he, he was been mid-tier Big Ten. Better in a better system with better yeah. pieces around him. I think that's fair. Yeah, he was a good player. I'm going to go scrambling to find his numbers. Every time I get into a conversation like this, I want to know, okay. Because, yeah, I watched a lot of Nate Shieldhouse. But I'll tell you, I'll tell you his numbers right time. here, Mark. He was uh, had a career per, uh, completion percentage of 63% through for nearly 8,600 yards. Um, had a career passer rating of 130. He was his senior year. He had 21 touchdowns to 13 picks for the for his career. Is 55 37 touchdown interception ratio. Um, let's see. He threw for 3,300 yards his senior year. So obviously very productive in 2013. Yeah, he was a mid to higher than mid Big Ten quarterback. And, and as we know, just because a guy's a great player doesn't mean he's going to be a great coach. No. Uh, and there's exceptions to that rule. It appears that Deion Sanders is a pretty good coach. It appears that way. Um, but but it, a lot is thought of Nathan Shieldhouse as a coordinator. And, and as any uh, quarterbacks coach. Well, he's a young guy. I mean, he's – he's um, and he, again, he's coached multiple positions at Iowa State. I don't even think he's coached quarterbacks there. He's coached – I think he's coached running back, maybe even wide receiver. Um, so uh, he has a good understanding. And, you know, that's the other thing. If, if Iowa wanted to really get creative with this hire, they could go out and get rid of Kelton Copeland. I know this, you know, we're talking about people's lives here. When I say get rid of them, I mean, you know what I mean? We're talking about business here. You move, you move Kelton Copeland to the side that you ain't getting it done at receiver. Bring in a guy like Josh Gaddis. Bring in a quarterback's coach. Have Josh Gaddis coach receivers. Bring in a guy who's solely focused on the quarterback position. You know, you could do all kinds of mixing and matching if Kirk really wanted to be creative. But as Tom said, he's, that's just not how Kirk operates, especially this late in his career. But I do think the idea of bringing in a guy like Grubb, if you could afford a guy like Grubb and tell him as the administration, hey, Kirk's only going to be here three more years or so. You are going to get a shot at this job because Phil's not going to want it in three years because he's probably going to be ready to retire. And Bob Stoops ain't going to want it. And Mark Stoops may not want it at that point. You know, I, I think it, that that is feasible for a young guy, not just Grubb, but but somebody else. They could potentially land somebody big. I just don't know that Kirk would accept that at this point because it may mean a, a significant change in philosophy. Yeah, you wonder if Kirk is more uh, adaptable because it's at this stage in his career that he may may be open to that or he would be less open to that because as people get older, they typically want less change or are less apt to change. As you've gotten older, Mark, do you have to have your lawn <laughs> mowed on a certain day and at a certain uh, time? And when you don't get it mowed at that certain time, you just, your blood pressure goes up and you just can't deal with life. Well, uh, I'm not quite <laughs> as old as Kirk. Number one. I know. I know. I may be looking at today in particular, but um, yes, I I, th I think that as people get older, they get set in their ways. So I'm probably set in my ways in certain ways that uh, I don't even recognize. But mowing the lawn, no, that would not be one of them. <laughs> or what time I have to have dinner or anything like that. No. Yeah. So. I will just say about this Red Goose game because we are running out of time and uh, we will be posting a video uh, here with the uh, USA Today Red Goose Wire guy uh, so people can be looking out for that uh, tomorrow. But um, yeah, I think these teams are very similar. I just have more confidence in Iowa. They're at home. 
I have more confidence. I, I would say, I would put it this way in a nutshell, the offenses, the way they operate, the way they try to execute extremely similar Rutgers on a scale of one to 10. If the Iowa offense is a one, one and a half, then Rutgers is a three and a half. It's still not a good offense, but it's much better, much, much more functional than Iowa's. However, Rutgers has a really good defense, but is it Iowa's defense? No, it is not Iowa's defense. And then I think the tipping point is Rutgers has adequate special teams and Iowa's elite on special teams. Right. So I think it's going to be a good game, but I'm pretty confident Iowa's going to get the job done when it matters. And we've said it before. I'll say it again. Iowa's offense will allow most teams to stay around, to stick around and have a shot. But Iowa's defense will give Iowa a chance to stick around in almost every game, except when you play someone who's just elite and basically in every category, like in Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan. We've seen that in recent time. Iowa doesn't get blown out by anybody else. They really don't. No. And it's just because of how they play. Like that defense in Wrigley this past Saturday, don't get me wrong, Northwestern is still Northwestern, but they've made explosive plays this year. They scored 21 points against a Minnesota team that beat Iowa a couple of weeks back. Um, they're more capable on offense than I would have expected under an interim head coach. So, I mean, Iowa just made them look completely incapable. Like it was just like, now they did score the one touchdown. They got a couple of short fields that you probably saw the goal line stance. It seems like weird things happen when Iowa plays at Northwestern. You had two years ago, you had the protesters this year. You have the, the <laughs> cavern of a, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, what was yeah. going on with that cavern? I mean, I know it was in the, the dugout, but why is the, why was the ground that soft? I don't understand how you can have a basically look like a shovel had had dug. How can you even play on that? I thought they were going to have to move to the other side of the field for safety reasons. They kept them down there. Um, and Iowa's goal line stance was really impressive. And then Torrey Taylor had a bad punt. And really, that's what it came down to. It got uh, Northwestern back inside the, I think, 25 yard line. And, you know, at some point, your defense can't just continue to, you know, forever hold a team outside of the end zone. But boy, that defense is good. And people earlier, this is one area where I will proudly say I was right. And a lot of people on this were wrong because after week one, people said, oh, this defense is not what it was last year. They've taken a step back. It's good, but they've taken a step back. And I said, I don't know about that. I, I have a lot of trust in Phil Parker. And I know Jack Campbell's gone and Seth Benson, and they didn't look great against Utah State. They are every bit as good as they were last year. I'd love to look at the numbers. But Cooper Gene is better than he was last year, and uh, Jay Higgins hasn't missed a beat. I mean, if Jack Campbell's better than Jay Higgins, sure, but it's not as big of a gap as people think. And believe me, if I'm if you give me an option between Seth Benson and Nick Jackson, I'm probably taking Nick Jackson, hmm. even though I really like Seth Benson. I think Nick Jackson's upside athleticism gives him that that notch ahead, and you know a lot of guys in the back end are older. Um, and they get they got Jamari Harris back, who gave up a touchdown Saturday, but for the most part, it's been very good. Made the game winning tackle on Saturday as well. But I think this defense is every bit as good, and they're doing it without Noah Shannon, who the NCAA still can't get that decision right. Uh, he's practicing with the team, but they have not gotten word from the NCAA. So um, I expect Iowa to hold Rutgers down, but if Rutgers can find a way to score two touchdowns, and that is possible, we've seen teams beat Iowa in low scoring affairs. If they can get to fourteen, they probably win. That's the honest truth. If they can get to 14 points, they probably win this game. I saw the over-under was open at like 28 and a half. I think it's up to 29 now. Iowa favored by one, which basically tells me, hey, this is on a neutral field. Rutgers is actually a favorite, so I'm a little surprised by that. But, uh, boy, you know, at some point, you can't go any lower on these lines, right? Like, <laughs> they're not going to open any lower, and yet they've all hit the under. Yes. They're all going to hit the under. <laughs> Except Michigan State, and that's because they took one to the house, Cooper DeGene, right. late in the game. Yeah, but I mean, like this past week, yeah. everybody, oh, the over-under. Oh. What was the over-under against Northwestern? Was it 30? Was it 28? Yeah, 30. Okay, and it, what was the final total was 17? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> so it's just, uh, it's amazing. I, I really want and, and can't wait to see them play a really good offense, which they will play in the Big Ten Championship game, a really good offense. I don't know if they're going to play an elite offense. Ohio State's not elite this year on offense. Michigan could be, maybe. They, they're they actually not um, churning out the kind of rushing yardage. Uh, they're actually struggling on the ground. 
because I was best the best offense that I would his face would be Penn State. Probably yeah, and by far. Penn State put up 31 on them. But again, those games don't ever tell the full story of Iowa's defense. They just don't. When you watch the game, you realize how bad the offense is and how bad of a position it consistently puts the other side of the ball in. They they it was 10 0 at halftime. They were in the game. Yeah. Um but but I'm making the point. Penn State's not that good on offense. Yeah, They're okay. Well, they, but Iowa's defense, we all can agree Iowa's defense was really, really good last year, and they gave up 50-some points to Ohio State on the road because of the same problem. Sure. Yeah. So I could see him going to the Big Ten Championship game giving up 30 to 40 points. I, I, I feel stupid saying that, but that's a reality when you play with this type of an offense. I mean, they don't have an offense, Mark. They, they do not have an offense. Deacon Hill is throwing for like 30 yards per game right now. That's literally what the offense is. He's throwing for like 30 yards per game. Now, the only play I saw on the final drive was the shot to Caleb Brown, his first catch of the year. So if he transfers, he made one big contribution to the team to lead to a game-winning field goal. Must have been the number because he switched to 81 so Cooper could play offense with as number three. He switched to 81 and then caught the pass. So they did They did drive at that final drive. They went about 40 yards, something like that. Yeah. So it was a reasonable drive. That was the most explosive play, I believe, in the game for either team. Yeah. And it was a nice... Nice throw, nice catch, and uh, Caleb Brown made a nice move after the catch and got a few extra yards and put him in position. And I said it. You can ask anybody that was watching the game with me, Mark. I said when when they got to the 40, I said it's over. Drew, Drew Stevens is going to make this field goal. And you watch him from that from 52. You watch that field goal, Mark. Have you ever yeah. seen a straighter field goal? Like that thing was – they were lined up in the in the center of the field, and that thing never wa- – I mean, just straight line. I don't know how yeah. a kicker does that. Yeah, it was an incredible kick, but that's what yeah. he does from 50 plus. It was. All right, folks, we appreciate you being here. Hawkeyes live 430 Central each and every Tuesday with Corey. Of course, uh, basketball season is starting. So join Corey more often than usual now at uh, from the Hawkeye of the Storm for football and men's and women's basketball coverage there. I've got a college football playoff watch party with the rankings being revealed tonight for the second time, if I could make it through and uh, we will watch it together and to analyze the rankings, expect a few small minor shifts. We'll see if Ohio state did enough to maintain a number one ranking. Uh, Alabama had a bit big week against LSU. They may move Texas survived. So there could be some, some minor shakeups, but nothing too major among the top seven or eight. Well, Mark, we'll look forward to that. And uh, Iowa basketball, men's basketball kicks off, tips off tonight. I will not be doing a live post game tonight, but uh, we'll have a reaction to that and post game coverage moving forward with Coach Close. And women's basketball in full swing. They won by like, what, 60 last night? And they'll play a, a huge game on Thursday against Virginia Tech. Both those teams, of course, were in the Final Four last year. So that should be fun. And, um, yeah, lots of Jason in the chat. Yes, I do not have li- I will not have live post game with with Gary tonight, but uh, stay tuned. It'll be it'll be here quickly. Um, but uh, we'll be recording some post game reaction. I won't be watching the game live. I'll just admit that's why I'm not going to be going live for the post game. I've got another engagement. So, uh, but plenty of plenty of stuff on the horizon. Excellent. And keep in mind, everyone, if you want to catch the audio. Uh, from these um, live editions, you can do that at from the Hawkeye of the Storm on your major audio platform of choice. And we will see you all back here next week. And again, I will take your calls at seven o'clock on the main channel for the college football playoff rankings. All right, Corey, thank you as always. Talk to you next week.